and with a straight face say that Democrats are launching the first partisan filibuster of a Supreme Court nominee. What the majority leader did to Merrick Garland by denying him even a hearing and a vote is even worse than a filibuster. For him to accuse Democrats of the first partisan filibuster on the Supreme Court belies the facts, belies the history, belies the basic truth. As my friend, Representative Adam Schiff has said, when McConnell deprived President Obama of a vote on Garland, it was a nuclear option. The rest is fallout. Let me repeat that. Adam Schiff put it better than I could ever. When McConnell deprived President Obama of a vote on Garland, it was a nuclear option. The rest is fallout. Now, even though my friend, the majority leader, keeps insisting that there is no principled reason to vote against Judge Gorsuch, we Democrats disagree. First, he has instinctively favored corporate interests over average Americans. Second, he hasn't shown a scintilla of independence from President Trump. And third, as my colleague from Illinois elaborated on, he was handpicked by hard right special interest groups, not because he'd call balls and strikes. They wouldn't put all that effort and money into a caller of balls and strikes. These are ideologues who want to move America far to the right. He was picked by hard right special interest groups because his views are outside the mainstream. According to analyses of his record on the Tenth Circuit, conducted by the New York Times and the Washington Post, by experts on the court, Judge Gorsuch would be one of the most conservative voices ever on the Supreme Court, should he achieve that. The Washington Post said that, quote, Gorsuch's actual voting behavior suggests he is to the right of both Alito and Thomas, and by a substantial margin. That would make him the most conservative justice on the court in recent memory. That's why the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society put Judge Gorsuch on their list for President Trump. As Emily Bazelon of the New York Times put it in a brilliant article that I would urge all my colleagues to read, <coughs> the reality is that Judge Gorsuch embra embraces a judicial philosophy that would do nothing less then undermine the structure of modern government, including the rules that keep our water clean, regulate financial markets, and protect workers and women. And I ask unanimous consent that that article be added into the record. Without objection. Mr. President, there are clearly principled reasons to oppose Judge Gorsuch. And enough of we Democrats have reasons to prevent his nomination from moving forward on Thursday's cloture vote. So the question is no longer whether Judge Gorsuch will get enough votes on the cloture motion. The question is now, will the majority leader and our friends on the other side break the rules of the Senate to approve Judge Gorsuch on a majority vote? That question should be the focus of the debate here on the floor, and it should weigh heavily on the conscience of every senator. Unfortunately, ultimately, my Republican friends face a simple choice. They can fundamentally alter the rules and traditions of this great body, or they can sit down with us Democrats and the President to come up with a mainstream nominee who can earn bipartisan support and pass the Senate. No one is making our Republican colleagues change the rules. No one is forcing Senator McConnell to change the rules. He's doing it at his own volition just as he prevented Merrick Garland from getting a vote at his own volition. Senator McConnell and my Republican colleagues are completely free actors and making a choice, a very bad one in our opinion. Now I know my friends on the other side of the aisle are uncomfortable with this choice. So they're scrambling for arguments to justify breaking the rules. Let me go through a few of these justifications and explain why each doesn't hold up. First, many of my Republican colleagues will argue that they can break the rules because, quote, Democrats started it in 2013 when we lowered the bar for lower court nominees and cabinet appointments. Well, let's talk about that. The reason Majority Leader Reid changed the rules was because Republicans had ramped up the use of the filibuster 
the very filibuster they now decry, to historic proportions. They filibustered 79 nominees in the first five years of Obama's presidency. Let's put that in perspective. Prior to President Obama, there were 68 filibusters on nominations under all other presidents combined, from George Washington to George Bush. Now we had 79. Our colleagues, Leader McConnell, the filibuster is wrong. 79, more than all the other presidents put together. She was on a different foot. They deliberately kept open three seats on the second most important court in the land, the D.C. Court of Appeals, because it had such influence over decisions made by the government. These are the, this is the court, other than the Supreme, that the Federalist Society, the Heritage Foundation, hate the most. The deal that we made, that a number of senators made in 2005, allowed several of the most conservative judges to be confirmed to that court. Very conservative people. Left a bad taste in my mouth, and I'm sure in my colleagues and in many others. But then, when President Obama came in, they insisted on not filing any, filling any additional seats on the court which of course would have been Democratic seats, and eventually held open three of the 11 seats on that court. They said they would not allow those seats to be filled by President Obama, an eerie precedent which the majority leader repeated with Merrick Garland. He didn't want the D.C. Circuit to have Obama-appointed, Democratic-appointed nominees. He didn't want that on the Supreme Court, so he blocked Merrick Garland. He didn't want it on the D.C. Circuit, so they wouldn't let any of these, any of President Obama's nominees come to the floor. Merrick Garland's nomination was not the first time the majority leader held open a judicial seat because it wasn't the president of his party, and that was not during an election year. At the time, I spoke to my good friend from Tennessee, Senator Alexander. I asked him to go to Senator McConnell and say the pressure on our side to change these rules after all these unprecedented number of filibusters was going to be large. I said to Senator, Mc uh, to Senator Alexander, let's try to avoid it. But Senator McConnell and Republicans refused all our overtures to break the deadlock they imposed. To be clear, Democrats changed the rules after 1,776 days of obstruction on President Obama's nominees. My Republican friends are contemplating changing the rules after barely more than 70 days of President Trump's administration. We moved to change the rules after 79 cloture petitions had to be filed. They are talking about changing the rules after one nominee fails to meet the 60-vote threshold. So yes, Democrats changed the rules in 2013, but only to surmount an unprecedented slowdown that was crippling the federal judiciary. And we left the 60-vote threshold intact for the Supreme Court deliberately. We could have changed it. We had free will then, just as Senator McConnell has it now. But we left the 60-vote threshold intact for the Supreme Court because we knew and know, just as our Republican friends know, that the highest court in the land is different. Unlike with lower courts, justices on the Supreme Court don't simply apply precedents of a higher court. They set the precedents. They have the ultimate authority under our constitutional government to interpret the law. Justices on the Supreme Court should be mainstream enough to garner by, by a substantial bipartisan support. Hence why we didn't change the rules. Hence why we believe in the 60-vote threshold. Hence why 55 or 60 percent of all Americans agree with the 60-vote threshold, according to the most recent polls. To me, and I think to most of my friends on the Republican side, that's not a good enough reason to escalate the argument and break the rules for the Supreme Court. Second, as I've mentioned,
I've heard my Republican friends complain that Democrats are conducting the first partisan filibuster of a Supreme Court nominee in history. So that's the reason they can justify breaking the rules, because Democrats are, are the ones taking it to a new level. Again, I have just two words for my Republican friends, Merrick Garland. The Republican majority conducted the first partisan filibuster of a Supreme Court pick when their members refused to have hearings for Merrick Garland. In fact, what the Republicans did was worse than a filibuster. The fact of the matter is, the Republicans blocked Merrick Garland using the most unprecedented of maneuvers. Now we are likely to bludge Judge Gorsuch because we're insisting on a bar of 60 votes. We think a 60-vote bar is far more in keeping with tradition than what the Republicans did to Merrick Garland. We don't think the two are equivalent, but nonetheless, in the history of the Scalia vacancy, both sides have lost. We didn't get Merrick Garland. We are, they are not getting 60 votes on Judge Gorsuch. So we're back to square one right now. And the Republicans have total freedom of choice in this situation. Finally, Republicans have started to argue that because Democrats won't confirm Judge Gorsuch, we won't confirm anyone nominated by President Trump. So they have to break the rules right now. That's an easy one. I'm the Democratic leader. I can tell you myself that there are mainstream Republican nominees who could earn adequate Democratic support. And just look at recent history. Justices Roberts and Alito, two conservative judges who many of us on the Democratic side probably don't agree with, both earned over 60 votes. They got Democratic votes. While there was a cloture vote on Justice Alito, he was able to earn enough bipartisan support that cloture was invoked with over 70 votes. He got only 58 when they voted for him, but the key vote was the cloture vote. Let's have the president consult members of both parties. He didn't, he didn't with Gorsuch, and try to come up with a consensus nominee who could meet a 60 vote threshold. That's what President Clinton did with my friend, the senator from Utah, in selecting Justices Ginsburg and Breyer. It's what President Obama did with Merrick Garland. Of course, we realize a nominee selected this way would not agree with many of our views. That's true. But President Trump was elected president, and he's entitled by the Constitution to nominate. But Judge Gorsuch is so far out of the mainstream that the Washington Post said his voting record would place him to the right of Justice Thomas. He was selected by the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society without an iota of input from the Senate. There's a better way to do this. I know it sometimes may seem like a foreign concept in our hyper-polarized politics these days, but there is always the option of actually consulting us Democrats on a nominee and discussing a way forward that both parties can live with. We are willing to meet anywhere, anytime. So Mr. President, my friends on the other side can dredge up these old wounds and shopworn talking points if they choose. If Republicans want to conduct a partisan, they started an exercise. I'm sure we could trace this all the way back to the Hamilton-Burr duel. But at the end of the day, they have to confront a simple choice. Are they willing to break the rules of the Senate, or can they work with us on a way forward? I, for one, hope that we can find a way to compromise. Justice Gorsuch, Judge Gorsuch was not a compromise, solely chosen without any consultation. So it's not that there's a mirror equivalency. As my friend the majority leader has said, quote, I think we can stipulate that in the Senate it takes 60 votes on controversial matters. If anything is a controversial, important matter, it's the selection of the Supreme Court. And Senator McConnell has repeatedly stood for the need, the rightness of 60 votes on important and controversial issues. If Senator McConnell wants to change his view on the 60 votes all of a sudden, 
and Republicans decide to go along with them, it won't be because Democrats started it, because that's not true. It won't be because Democrats won't confirm any President Trump nominated justice, because that's not true. It will be because they choose to do so, and they